Thanks so much, Anya, and uh, thanks to, to Stephen and Tom. Uh, it's a real honor to be uh, grouped with you. Uh, seven years together as national security advisors, but many years, of course, beyond that in government and dealing with these issues. And in my interactions, as I'm sure many folks listening today will say, both Stephen and Tom prove themselves uh, to be not only smart and knowledgeable, but also very fair uh, and open-minded. I've certainly always appreciated that. So I look forward to hearing, uh, hearing your insight on, on so many of the things that we're facing today. I just only wish we were in Aspen, but you know, 2020 is the year of the is the year of the endless Zoom call, so here we find ourselves again. Um, I, I might ask just to, just to begin, is to imagine yourselves back in your roles as national security advisors uh, to the next president or a reelected president uh, and a meeting with them the day after the inauguration in 2021. And what would you lay out to them as the biggest threat? Uh, famously, Barack Obama, uh, communicated to Donald Trump uh, in 2017, it was North Korea, most immediate biggest national security threat. So picture yourselves uh, in that position the day after the inauguration 2021, what would you say uh, to the reelected president or the new president is the biggest threat to the country? And, and, and what would you uh, recommend, what would, how would you lay out the world to them in that conversation in brief if you can? and, and uh, Tom, I, if I could start with you, just since you happen to be next to me in the window, and then, and then Stephen next. Great. Okay. All right. Thank you, Jim. And Steve, nice to be with you today. Thank you, Anya, for the, intro, for the introduction. Um, Jim, you've got to get the book a little more centered in the, uh, in the picture here so we can, so people can see it there. There we go. I'll just the, put it on just yeah. on my shoulder. Right. <laughs> right. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Super. Uh, yeah, Jim, I, I, I have a, I'll give a couple of uh, responses to that, to that good question. One is... Uh, uh, sitting here today, I hope we move through the challenge we have in front of us here, which is really through a very important moment for our democracy uh, and the pressure in our democracy, and that is to have a, uh, uh, a competent and vibrant election um, with a, an agreed upon uh, outcome and strong support for the next president, whoever that, uh, whoever that is. I think that's really our challenge right now. You know, our, our leadership in the world re is really in many ways dependent on both our being uh, and are being seen as a vibrant and importantly competent democracy. Competence has been a very important part of the United States uh, place in the world, its authority in the world uh, from, uh, from World War II until, until today. So that, that hopefully we'll, we will get through that moment. Uh, on January 20th, um, and Steve and I have both had these, these, uh, these sessions many, many times with, uh, with presidents, I'd, I'd, I'd have two or three things. Uh, let's do it very briefly, we can come back to them. One would be, uh, even, uh, even, if, even if it's a national security briefing, the focus would have to be on domestic renewal uh, and meeting what is still going to be, I think, the, uh, you know, the, the tripartite challenges in finance, economics, employment, and health, and social justice. These will be with us going into next year, uh, for sure. That, I think, requires an investment agenda uh, for, the, uh, for the country. Uh, both Steve and I and Anya have written about this. Uh, and, uh, and it's interesting, I think, that, that, that a... A, a sharply targeted, uh, smart investment agenda can actually address a number of the challenges that we have, including the economic challenges, uh, including China, and we'll come back to that, I'm sure, during the course of this discussion, and climate, uh, in terms of climate investment in climate infrastructure and uh, technology. Uh, second would be, and what will be, I think, the most important diplomatic national security challenge, as far as the eye can see in this century, would be to develop a coherent and comprehensive approach with respect to China. Uh, I know we'll come back to that, but I, I fear we're too reactive, defensive right now, and we're not using all the elements of national power. And I would think as a national security advisor to the next president, um, developing that kind of all of comprehensive power approach uh, to the China challenge would be absolutely critical. I'll just mention a couple of others which, which haven't, gotten, haven't gotten a lot of attention, I think, but would be certainly in my mind if I were giving this briefing. Uh, next would be cyber. We don't talk about it a lot uh, of late, uh, but if you look at the, uh, if you look at the uh, Director of National Intelligence threat assessments for the last five or six years, it's at the top of the list. I think it's even greater today. Mm -hmm. I say that for a number of reasons, including, by the way, exemplified by the way in which we're having this meeting today, uh, we have a lot of our nations, and indeed the world's GDP, online right now and virtually with all kinds, I think, of, of vulnerabilities. Um, we have increased tensions with uh, states that have uh, 
uh, high caliber cyber capabilities like Iran, China, Russia, and Iran. Um, we have uh, an entire new uh, area of attack space growing and the Internet of Things. So I, I think we have not given such a We're not really structured, I think, the way we should be in the, in the White House on this is cyber. I would be looking at nonproliferation as well. Mm. Now, I, I heard uh, from the, the, that it was touched on during the course of the, um, or addressed during the course of the, the, the session uh, to date. Um, I think we're on a path right now which, which, which could end up with more countries with nuclear weapons and more nuclear weapons, period. And this includes, obviously, I would have moving to a redo or re, uh, re up the New START Treaty. I think, uh, you know, you've seen the reports today, Reuters reported, reported on a UN report today on Korea, North Korea making progress on its program during the pendency of the, uh, the negotiations with the administration. Iran is closer to a nuclear weapon uh, today than it was uh, uh, two or three years ago. And I don't think we're working as hard enough on fissile material uh, and locking that, locking it down the way we should. And last couple would be, well, not the last, but climate um, would be a, a, an important focus, I think, for the next, should be an important focus next president. You know, it's interesting. The United States has kind of been out of the climate, um, addressing the climate policy game uh, for the last uh, you know, three and a half years. That's not where the world is right now, though. Uh, you know, and and uh, if you live in the investment world and the economic world, uh, talk to Europeans and, and, and even more so in, increasingly in Asia, climate is at the front of the agenda, right? I mean, for, uh, increasingly, uh, CEOs around the world see climate risk as investment risk, and we should certainly see it as a risk here. Um, and the last, uh, the last two things I'd say is this, it hasn't gotten a lot of attention. One of the great kind of firestorms coming out of COVID is in the emerging world. Uh, we, we obviously have to deal with our issues here, but going forward, uh, the emerging world and the Southern uh, hemisphere especially are in the middle of a perfect storm on COVID. We're gonna have, I think, a debt crisis uh, for, for a long time, require a lot of international work. And last, I, would, I think we need to, um, uh, look at reinvigorating, kind of restoring our national security institutions, and maybe we can talk about that yeah. that later. That would be the briefing I would give if I were there on, on January twentieth at uh, uh, at whatever time in the morning the president the president comes in. I had it, I had it a little easier than Steve. George W. Bush came in very early uh, in the morning. <laughs> Stephen, your briefing. So uh, I would agree with everything Tom said, but I thought, think before I got to those, I would have a little conversation. Mr. President, what's going on in the world right now? Why so much chaos? And I think I would step in through with what we've all know, that the international order and international system we've had for the last 70 years is really under attack. Uh, and it's under attack for the things we all know, the reemergence of great power competition the reemergence of an ideological struggle between authoritarian state capitalists on the heart of Russia and China versus the Democrats. Uh, new technology challenges that are increasingly revolutionizing uh, our world beyond our ability to cope and adapt. Uh, global challenges like pandemics and climate that we don't seem to be in a position to manage. Uh, so all of these things are going on, but more fundamentally, we have a problem here at home. Uh, we have a democracy that does not seem to be delivering what democracies deliver, not only the best a, a, a way of life that is consistent with the highest aspirations of the, of the human spirit, but democracy used to deliver economic growth uh, and uh, administrative competence. And we don't seem to be doing that so well right now. And there's a certain crisis of confidence among our people in our institutions, in our system. And if you look internationally, our brand doesn't look so good. Yeah. And in addition, the American people have gotten a little tired of American leadership and always leading the way. So if you put all those things together, we're at one of these inflection points where the system we lived with is really breaking down. And we, as you as always inflection points, you have choices. And in some sense, the choice we have before us is this, is this gonna be 1919 or is it gonna be 1945? Mm. Are we gonna pull back from the world, focus internally, uh, look to our own problems and let the world in some sense deal with its own? Or is it gonna be 1945 where we are gonna help found with our friends and allies a revised and adapted international order? Uh, I would hope we would make that second choice. But if we're gonna do that, we need to fix our institutions at home, 
We need to reconnect with our allies. We need to start leading and engaging in the world. We need to start revising, adapting international institutions. Uh, and we need to start, uh, in some sense, refreshing our brand in the world and our values in the world. Yeah. So, Mr. President, you have a huge task before you. And we've got to address all the things Tom talked about. But we have to somehow explain to the American people what is this moment and what the most fundamental choice is. And then you have to make a case to the American people that fixing at home, engaging abroad, and leading the world is still in America's interest. Mm. Uh, thanks to both of you. Thought provoking on, on, on so many levels. You know, it's interesting, as you were speaking, I recalled a conversation at Aspen, I believe it was three years ago, and I did it with Jim Clapper. And he raised a concern then, I mean, this is three years ago, about the fragility of U.S. institutions. And that, you know, because I had asked him at the time, I said, kind of apply your intelligence brain that you often apply to other countries, you know, measures of stability, et cetera, to look at the U.S. and what concerns you. And that was his concern. And listen, I think borne out in the last several years about crisis of confidence, uh, et cetera. So, so to that point, I mean, Aspen is a continuing conversation. So I, I certainly felt that there. Um, okay, it, it's a lot to cover and I do, you know, we will in a few minutes get to, to participant questions. On the question of Russia, Tom and Stephen, as, as you know, there, there is a uh, discussion now often led by the president of uh, another reset, uh, finding a way forward. I've had long conversations with Fiona Hill about this. That's it. You know, at the root of, of a lot of President Trump's outreach to Russia is his conviction that he can somehow get this relationship right, which is, he's not the first president to, to believe that. Um, Tom, you first, and then you, Stephen. Is there the groundwork now, the, the, the potential for somehow improving that relationship? How, how does that match up against Russia's uh, increasing aggression on, on so many fronts? Uh, what's your view? And then, Stephen, I'll get yours. Yeah, great. Um, 10 seconds on your point, uh, Jim, on, on Jim Clapper's uh, observation. That's exactly right. If you, if you do kind of an old fashioned net assessment of the United States position in the world, you would bet on the United States moving forward here for sure, right? But there are challenges and you can't take it for granted. And we have system issues that, uh, Steve, the system breakdown. We have investment issues. We have inequality issues in the United States. Uh, we have some big policy choices on things like immigration to ensure our demographic advantage going forward. Those are choices. They're all in front of us, though, uh, as Steve said. So we, have a, we work from a strong base, but it can't be taken for granted. On Russia, uh, a couple of things. I, I would put it fairly, fairly directly. Um, number one is that Russia is actively hostile to the United States pretty much across the board right now. Uh, and um, you know, we have had this, you know, this latest uh, reporting on uh, bounty, uh, the bounty uh, issue in, uh, in Afghanistan, but it's, it's, it's well beyond that. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and virtually across the board, we can talk about the individual instances. Uh, and by the way, that's not the first, that's not the first instance in Afghanistan. You had General Nicholson at, talking about this publicly uh, with respect to supplying arms to the, uh, to the Taliban. So we're they're actively hostile across the, uh, across the, uh, the board. And, um, you know, I'm, uh, I think that at least the public presentations from our intelligence community seem to be unanimous that we can expect additional attacks uh, and interference and, Kind of upset the United States elections in uh, uh, in 20 uh, in 2020. First point. Uh, second point is that I think that uh, the United States uh, should address Russia from a from a, from a, a better position of strength. You know, Dean Acheson had that had that phrase, you know, in his in his memoirs called "Situations of Strength." The United States should build situations of strength in Europe uh, with respect to uh, with respect to Russia, uh, and that means. And I, I heard, uh, at least saw press reports about uh, Ambassador Bolton's uh, conversation at the, this forum today, uh, speculating about whether or not a second term of President Trump would have him pull back further from, from NATO. You know, this is dividing the United States from Europe has been both the goal of the Soviet Union uh, and indeed Russia uh, for, for a long time. And pushing back on that and addressing that, I think, is, is really quite, uh, uh, quite important. Um, this will depend, I think, uh, going forward here. Uh, on Russian on Russian conduct, I think we should move forward to build obviously these position of strength. But Russian conduct will matter a lot, I think, during the course of this election. Uh, and I do think we do in the in the opportunity cooperation uh, category, uh, we do have an opportunity 
I think, to get back to the table and renew uh, the new start agreement, which provides for a renewal period of up to five years uh, if the two sides agree. For the life of me, I don't know why we wouldn't do that. Uh, you know, we have a discussion going about whether or not we should add the Chinese to some sort of very complicated tripartite global uh, arms control agreement. That, that's not on the table right now. Uh, but what is on the table is, I think, to not have us get to a place for the first time in half a century without any constraints. So, I think those those would be the the, uh, kind of the elements of a the elements of an approach that I that I put forward. Thank you, Jim. Stephen. I don't disagree with much of that. I think, though, it needs to be put in a framework. So if you're talking to the president, one of the questions is, well, what can we expect uh, of a relationship with Russia? What should we be shooting for? Uh, I think they are, they are hostile. They are a spoiler almost across the board. Uh, and, and so what is the kind of relationship we can hope for with a country that really has become an adversary? And I think the American approach to that has been really of long-standing administration after administration, and it's not complicated. Uh, it is basically to, uh, to uh, cooperate with a potential adversary where we can. Uh, we cooperated with arms control with, in the worst days of the Cold War with the Soviet Union. We should have a, a strategic stability conversation with Russia to develop all of these issues. So cooperate where we can oppose them and stand up for our principles where it is in our interest to do so, but manage those differences so that they don't result into permanent confrontation or military conflict. That's kind of the formula we have with adversaries. We're off the page with Russia on that. The question is, can we get Russia back on that page? I think a couple things required. One, they've got to not interfere with this election. If they interfere with this election, as they did with 2016, we're going to go into the deep freeze again. Second, we need to try to make pro progress on uh, beginning to solve Ukraine, initially addressing the Donbass issue. I think there's a possibility there. There's a ceasefire in place, shaky though it is, uh, that should be addressed. And again, I would try to begin things like a strategic stability dialogue. But at the same time, we have to deter Russia from their, their intervention and interference with the neighbors. That means a strong relationship in NATO. And that means being more aggressive ourselves in checking Russian behavior. And it's not that hard. Putin has been brilliant, taking tactical advantage of situations and enhancing Russians' interest with very modest investments. We can counter that. So it is, it is trying to engage Russia in a in a, in a sensible way, but also deterring and, uh, and in some sense taking away the, in some sense the free ride Russia has had in some areas for their interference. This is something we can do. You know, it's interesting listening to, to, to just the, the overlap between both of your analysis and, and emphasis, right? Uh, what what is notable, of course, right, is, is that we have we have a president who, who disagrees on many of those fundamental points. I mean, one being the, the importance and sanctity of alliances, and, and that extends to, to to NATO. We're still in it. Bolton's concern about leaving it, but you know, just general questions the president has raised about, for instance, Article Three. You know, defending uh, defending NATO partners. I mean, uh, but not just limited to NATO, right? I mean, you've had. Uh, you know, a weakening of, of the South Korean alliance, just a dispute there again over money. Will the U.S. withdraw troops as a, as a means of, um, you know, applying pressure? Uh, but even again, you know, raising questions about the U.S. nuclear umbrella, for instance, for Japan, right? So, so you, ha you have a current administration, or at least the top of the administration, that questions the, you know, the immutability of those alliances, but also the importance of them. So I, I wonder if I could ask both of you, what is the lasting damage to those alliances from those questions being raised, right? Because, I mean, they're confidence pieces, right? And confidence is easily lost and, and, and uh, difficult to regain. Stephen, perhaps I start with you on this one, but, but mm -hmm. is there, is there long-term damage? Can it be turned around uh, with a new approach, a new president? Uh, I think it can be turned around uh, whoever is elected, whether it is Biden or Trump. Mm -hmm. And I think Jim and I will, pro uh, Tom, Tom and I will probably uh, disagree a little bit on this. Look, um, I'm, I'm less worried 
about pres a reelected President Trump pulling out of these alliances. I think there are a lot of people who, in his administration, who understand that, particularly in a competition with China, the big advantage we have is our system of alliances, treaty allies, but also friends and folks with whom we have security and other relationships, that this is a huge and important U.S. Uh, resource. So if you're worried about competition with China, the last thing you want to do is throw it away. What the president has tried to do is to get the allies to do more. Uh, it's, that's been an objective of Republican and Democratic administrations for the last 20 years. Uh, the president has been willing to be much more forthright about it and threatening about it. We can discuss about whether that was the right tactics or not. In some respects, he's gotten some results out of NATO in terms of, of their increase in their defense expenditures. But I think, uh, look, this is a president who was elected to be a disruptor on oh so many ways. He has been a disruptor. I would hope both a Biden one administration and a Trump two administration, the president would become a bit of a builder now, having disrupted relationships renew those relationships uh, and, and uh, then use our, our close allies with us to address these challenges we have. It's the only way we're gonna address them successfully. And I think people around the president understand that. And I, I hope uh, both uh, uh, Vice President Biden and President Trump understand that in their bones. Tom, do you agree? Uh, not with everything, uh, but <laughs> a couple of, I agree, I agree on, the, on the fundamental analysis. You know, one big point uh, is that at the end of the day, presidents typically get the people and the policies that they want. Uh, and that's, I think we've seen that during the course of the Trump administration as we've moved from, well, uh, he won't pursue a lot of the things he said he was going to pursue during the campaign because he'll have advisors around him who may mitigate that and bring, ba bring back and in, in place uh, you know, a, a different, different perspective. That hasn't been the case, obviously. Ultimately, a president, I think, will drive towards what his, what his goals are. And the president has a different view of alliances. I think that's a fair assessment. I don't think that's a partisan statement. Uh, I think that if he were in the, in, in the chat room with us right now, I think he would, he would say that. Uh, mm -hmm. That, in fact, he doesn't seem that it's a more transactional approach. Uh, it doesn't have the same sense of history and the same sense of importance to the United States in terms of the global, as Steve pointed out, the global benefits to the United States we get from alliances, including in any competition uh, with China, not just security, but also in trade and economics uh, as well. The administration's chosen a different way. It's chosen bilateral trade uh, approaches, and it's chosen to a, uh, a more unilateral approach on security issues. So this transactional approach is a very different approach than you've had by presidents. Uh, over the last half century. And by the way, it doesn't put aside the issue of Steve said of, of contributions by allies. You know, it was essentially, it was, it was President Obama in 2014 at the Wales NATO summit who put in place the goal of having a 2% contribution of GDP to, uh, for, for, for defense. The other thing I worry about here, Jim, is, um, is popular support for the alliance in allied countries. That has dropped. Uh, and that's, that's not healthy for the United States and it's not necessary. So I do think, as Steve said, I think there's a, whoever gets elected president, there is an opportunity uh, to come back in and kind of reinvigorate, uh, reinvigorate our alliances. But there's been a different tact taken uh, in the last three and a half, in three and a half years. And again, a, uh, not a it's very straightforward difference uh, in, in uh, an approach, which I don't think works to our, works to our long-term advantage. It is this more, don't you think it's this more transactional mm. uh, approach on things. And so you have, you know, so that sort of, I'm dealing with a, I'm dealing with the, with the head of an allied country or an adversary, it's kind of the same thing. And yeah. it's not the same thing when you think about kind of the long-term interest of the country and what we've gained from these alliances over the last 70 years. Well, it's interesting for my book, I, by the way, I interviewed only folks who served in the Trump administration. And when mm -hmm. I asked everyone to, to boil the president's foreign policy approach down, transactional was the, mo was the most um, you know, common description. And you know, some see that as folly and others see it as wisdom. Right, you know, to, as you described, you know, getting more out of those relationships, whatever the pressure of pride applied. Uh, we're two minutes away from from going to the audience, and, and folks, just so you know, you'll use your raise hand function to do that. Before we get there, I wonder if just very briefly I could ask each of you what is a big picture question. So I'm being a little bit unfair to you, but if you can, on drawing down U.S. troops from not just in Afghanistan but a Syria you know, ending the endless wars or finding a way to extract ourselves from that, from them. 
can each of you make an argument that it is time, for instance, to, to, to come out of Afghanistan, for instance? Uh, Tom, perhaps you first, and then Stephen. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, a couple of points on that. Um, it, you know, I have argued for um, a, if you will, a rebalancing of our defense forces globally. Uh, and I think, and again, we've gone a different direction, frankly, during the course of the Trump administration. The president has argued for and argued in the campaign, no more endless wars. Um, and uh, and that was a part of the core message that he put forward during the course of the 2016 campaign. But in fact, we've probably, I think we've sent, you'll check me on the numbers, 40 or 50,000 additional troops to the Middle East yeah. during, the course of, uh, during the course of the Trump uh, presidency. Uh, my own view is that that takes attention from the kind of defense uh, and security rebalancing we need to do towards Asia, frankly, um, where um, uh, where I think we have not put in place the kind of the the, the proportion of assets, the, the new doc, the doctrine, weapon systems, uh, coordination systems. I think that we need uh, in uh, in Asia. So I I am for a rebalancing out of the out of the out of the wars in the uh, in the uh, in the Middle East. Um, uh, the second piece of that, of course, is it's exceedingly expensive. Uh, I think that the the so-called OCO account, you know, the 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 account in the defense budget that is that is devoted just to the war uh, efforts in the Middle East. I think, again, we'll, I'll, well, someone in the audience will check me on this, I'm sure, but it's, I think it's around 19 or 20 billion dollars a year at this point. Uh, that is close to the entire budget of the State Department, so it is it is tremendously expensive, and so I do think it makes sense to take a hard look at this and to, and to, and to rebalance, draw down to what's essential probably uh, having uh, the, the key policy focus on, uh, on counterterrorism, uh, frankly, and, kind of, and, and, and keeping your eye on that, that threat. Last 10 seconds on the Middle East, I would say, is that you won't, you're, you're in these jobs and you have to decide what's important, right? Um, what's important in the Middle East right now, I think, is the Iranian nuclear program. And we can talk about that maybe in, in the chat. That is, if you're gonna make a list of what's important there, uh, uh, in addition, obviously, to getting the troop levels right, and I, I am for moving, moving, moving those troop levels down. I think that's, I think that's the correct direction. I think the Iranian nuclear program is, from a U.S. perspective, the most important thing in that region right now. Stephen, your view. So, you know, we talk about these bringing an end to the endless wars, and at one level, those endless wars are already over for the yeah. United States. Uh, because uh, we have already done a lot of the rebalancing Tom has already talked about. Uh, we have something like five to 6,000 troops in Iraq. Uh, we're down to about 8,600 in Afghanistan. We have literally only hundreds in Syria. So in some sense, we've already rebalanced. And it is our allies, the, the strategy which we developed of working by, with, and through other allies uh, is is now what we're doing in those areas. Now, I don't minimize the fact that our men and women in uniform are at risk, and we, and some of them are being killed, and every one of them is one too many. But the, from the fact is, from the U.S. perspective, we have already rebalanced. And if you look at those deployments, uh, if you're concerned about Iran, not just the nuclear deal, but also Iran's disruptive behavior in the region and threat to Israel and all the rest. If you're gonna check Iran in the region, Iraq is one of the few places you're gonna be able to do it in terms of US troop presence and a country that actually wants to be a freer of Iranian influence. In Afghanistan, you have the first opportunity in 20 years to see if we can get a peaceful settlement of that war. The last thing you wanna be doing is dramatically reducing our forces and undermine the ability of an Afghan government and an Afghan society to negotiate with the Taliban. And in Syria, I would say we have too few people. And the, the, the tragedy of Syria, people say that, uh, that Iraq is a, shows the consequences of a sin of commission. I think Syria is consequences of sin of omission and the, the destabilizing migration flows that almost destabilized Europe. So I think uh, they were in some sense under-resourced in Syria if we don't want that situation to yeah. even be worse. So I think we've already rebalanced. We have it about right. Uh, we can afford it and it is proportional to our interests. Yeah. It's interesting, it, it, it's done a lot of work on the military's effort to maintain just the smallest foothold in Syria to do as 
the maximum they could do with with the and, and try to push off the, the, the president's desire to pull everybody out and and it's you know it's tough it's it's been tough but but they managed yeah. to keep some on the ground listen thanks to both of you i learned a lot even in that 34 minutes right there before we go to the audience <laughs> Uh, so we're going to go to the audience now, um, and the first person uh, who I see raising his hand is Chad Mansky, and I believe if you're ready for your question, we'll all be able to hear it. Hey there, Chad. Here's your chance. Hey, hi. Thank you very much. Uh, very thought provoking uh, presentation. Uh, I'd like to ask the two gentlemen, based on their experience as national security advisors, in addition to the briefing items that they noted at the outset of the presentation, what kind of recommendations would they make regarding the size, structure, and organization of the National Security Council to best serve the next president? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, Tom has, has, I think, probably more developed views than I. I. I would just make a couple of points. One, I think it needs to be rethought and restructured. You know, people talk about we need a whole of government approach, uh, you know, bringing all elements of national power, diplomatic, economic, military to bear on a problem. Uh, if things like the competition with China, we need a whole of society approach because the private sector uh, the uh, civil society, uh, there, are, there are a whole series of, of, of societal groups are going to be required, including individual citizens as we resist China's efforts to disrupt our politics. So it's going to require a concerted effort, and we don't have the institutions to pull together a whole of society approach. We have a big issue about how, since China is going to affect almost everything, how do you organize the National Security Council to deal with the issue of China? A China czar, does that really make sense? Or is it actually something that has to be top of the mind for all the National Security Council principles? The impact of technology, which has revolutionized how we do business, and I think we still haven't caught up to where the technology is. So I think there's a huge amount that needs to be done. We need to, to, to rethink how we do business both in the interagency, but also I would say in the individual agencies and a number of people have talked about and written about what, what should be done at the State Department, for example. Yeah, I, I kind of a cut, Chad, thanks for that question. I have a couple of um, points on it. Um, I'm not so sure the National Security Council is too big. Um, you know, there are, uh, we can go back to the history, history of this in, uh, you know, it's taken on a lot of additional coordination responsibilities um, over the years, including homeland security and some of these all of government issues that Steve talked about. Specifically, though, I, I do think there is needs to be some restructuring and re-emphasis around three or four items. Item number one, Steve references technology. Um, we, we do not do a good job in the United States government today of integrating technology and national security policy. Uh, and you know, if you and it, it's it, it's some of it is because of the kinds of people, frankly, uh, that are in policy and the kinds of people who are in technology. And bringing them together, I think, is a really important aspect. I think we'll have a ton of issues of first impression. Uh, it is absolutely essential uh, in our effort to uh, meet the China challenge uh, to get this uh, to get this right. We have all manner of issues uh, with our uh, technology uh, sector in the United States that affects national security. So my recommendation would be to have a uh, an assistant to the president level, a deputy national security advisor who coordinates these issues for technology and cybersecurity, um, as, as someone who can use the 75-year-old or 70-year-old muscle memory and, inst and kind of uh, institutions and processes of the National Security Council to try to get that together and do that right. You know, I don't think, for example, today we have that kind of really kind of broad-based look at the technology competition with China, for example. So technology, cyber, and health, uh, for sure. I think that you'll need to have in the National Security Council a much, a much um, more uh, focused effort uh, on, uh, on international on health issues, international health issues, and I think the kind of the, the refurbishing of international institutions will be an important, uh, uh, an important focus of the National Security Council going forward. So I'm not so sure. I'm in, I'm in a minority on this. I think I don't think as I look at it, the National Security Council is too big. There are a lot of issues that need to be brought together, and you cannot drive these big 
cross-cutting issues except from the center. I know that uh, my, my agency, and I've been, I've been the chief of staff of an agency at the State Department. I understand that, that dynamic between the, uh, between the White House and the agencies, but the truth is that, these, that, these, that the president's policies need to be driven uh, from the center uh, on an interagency basis. And as Steve said, I think with, with, with another challenge, which, which we need to give a lot more thought to, which is how do you get other stakeholder input as well as all society efforts. But I don't think it's too big. I do think it should be reorganized around some of these key challenges we have, particularly in technology. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. You, you see technology government at loggerheads, right, rather than cooperating now more and more. Guys, we're down to like the last minute. I, I did want to get to one more audience question. Stephen Keenan has his hand raised. Maybe, Stephen, you can just keep it quick. And, and given the time, uh, if you have one of our guests more in mind to ask the question, otherwise I'll give them both a chance for a quick answer. Yes, thank you. For, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. So thank you very much for an informative discussion. Um, I've been busy with Ukraine, but I also was in Afghanistan. Remember Afghanistan before the last 42 years of war started and was there when the <clears throat> war started with Soviet Union teaching English. Both of you are familiar with the word loyal jerga. You both worked on encouraging Afghanistan having loyal jerga. We have a president right now that prides himself as being the great communicator. I came up with a word one time during the cold, at the end of the Cold War after 89, when the Berlin Wall went down, thankfully, of tell a jerga the jihad. And what I mean by that, with the 1,100 clans inside Afghanistan, why don't we have the president give each of those clans a telephone and encourage that even though we live in a democracy where we have one uh, vote for each person here in the beautiful, wonderful United States, that's not necessarily how Afghanistan relates to things. Okay. And I think that if we gave them the telecommunications capability as a gift, a satellite, free mobile service, telephones to each of the clans, and we could create a modern day lawyer jerger for them that they could have every week if they wanted to. I'm not a big fan of the Taliban, but I feel that we need to stay with some sort of presence. But I think now, especially with President Trump being gifted as being a, a good communicator on TV, especially, this could be a good time for that. How do you feel about that, please? Okay, Stephen, you want to take that one? Well, I, I, on, I, the specifics are interesting, but I think the broader point you're making is that technology offers enormous opportunities that we did not have before. And one of the things we're learning in this post-COVID-19 world is how to be more adept at using technology. And you've just given one example. There are lots of examples. And that's why I think Tom is right, that we really, the next president, whoever it is, needs to have a, uh, a, a someone at the NSC at senior levels who can work at how to utilize technology both within our government, but also yeah. in our diplomacy. Yeah, we really do need to bring science and technology that really to the center of policy making in the, uh, in the United States, as we did, by the way, after, uh, after World War II. Yeah, yep. so sadly, we have an anti-science movement going on now, but that's on another topic. Tom, Tom and Stephen, uh, thanks to both of you. Uh, I, I enjoyed taking part. I'm gonna throw this back to Anya. Uh, who's going to help uh, wrap things up.